introduce our speakers, Stuart Rees, Professor Emeritus at the University of Sydney and a human rights activist. He's also author of Cruelty or Humanity, Challenges, Opportunities and Responsibilities, which published recently. And Jake Lynch, Associate Professor in the Department of Peace and Conflict Studies at the University of Sydney. Stuart and Jake will be in conversation for about 20 minutes, and then Jake will be asking Stuart your questions. So please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. If you have any technical issues, please use the chat function. Details of how to order the book at 50% discount will be available here too. I'm now going to hand over to Stuart and Jake. Thanks, Catherine, and uh, good afternoon and welcome everybody. Um, Stuart, um, we're talking about your book, uh, Cruelty or Humanity, uh, and um, you know that we've been sparring and uh, sharing and collaborating over such issues for many years now. Uh, and we've both been fated um, to be peace professors. We've gone around the world with, with that word peace attached to our names. But in the foreword to the book, in the dedication, in fact, you dedicate the book to those with the courage to struggle for peace with justice and those who have never experienced peace with justice. So why should justice be appended to peace, in particular in the context of a world full of cruelties uh, where we are all trying to find and exert a modicum of humanity? Yeah, great start question, Jake. Look, you know that I'm interested in peace, but I am 1,000 times more interested in peace with justice. And peace usually means stopping fighting. It can mean a ceasefire. It means, have you stopped beating your wife? But the issue of what the quality of life is that follows the end of violence isn't addressed unless you talk about peace with justice, which means the elimination of poverty, the provision of housing, uh, attention, if you like, to all the 30 clauses in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Now, indeed, that um, declaration provides for um, what you and I have always known as, as positive peace. Um, that's really what we're saying. Peace is something that has to be built and programmed in and provided for. Um, is it the same with cruelty in the sense that it's very easy to point at individual acts of cruelty, acts of volition, direct cruelty, we could say, uh, but is cruelty also embedded in policy responses, structures and systems which fail to provide for people to fulfil their potential? Absolutely. I mean, it's, um, I, I've looked at uh, democracies, dictatorships, theocracies, and it's apparent that the cruelty that persists is really no different, despite the claims, let's say, in the West that they are um, uh, morally and in human rights terms far better, far more advanced than other parts of the world. No, the cruelty became apparent to me is heavily built into, uh, into cultures which um, take for granted the, the use of power from, from the top down. And the fact that cruelty is seldom mentioned even by um, uh, self-respecting academics, it hardly ever appears in the index suggests to me that um, you know it's part of a culture it's not it's not in people's dna indeed and um you know we could even perhaps bring ourselves up to date with a couple of recent developments one here in the uk um is that um the chancellor rishi sunak has announced um a cut in britain's overseas aid budget uh, the britain signed up to the um, target of having 0.7 percent of gross national income allocated to overseas development aid and stuck with that through a, a two-party consensus for many years. Uh, now it's going to be cut. Uh, now it, it seems to many of us that uh, if the beneficiaries of Britain's overseas aid tend to be poor and tend to be in foreign countries, that makes them a bit of an easy target uh, for a government which is, which is still mired in this kind of Trumpian assumption that you can turn people against each other in order to kind of make political capital. Yeah, well, I mean, the essence of your question is whether whether uh, policy is um, is is the uh, is the means of, of cruelty. I mean, you will know uh, that from about uh, the recent report in this country about Australian soldiers murdering at will thirty nine innocent Afghani's, including the slitting of throats of young teenagers and and throwing them into rivers. And that coincides with reports from the states, from the United States, that 50% of the people of the United States are going hungry. 
one in four, almost one in three children do not have enough to eat. So the idea that you know, cruelty is only um, uh, observable from so-called direct violence is, um, is a misnomer. Now, we've seen recently um, things like uh, d demonstrations in this country and elsewhere um, against the lockdown provisions to try to limit the spread of coronavirus. And um, I saw one the other day where there was an image of somebody holding up a banner and somebody else had, had transposed some new words onto this banner, which said, um, you know, I, I, I'm protesting at minor inconvenience as a form of oppression only because I've never experienced genuine impression myself so I don't know what it's like okay so I think there's a lot of that about there's there's a lot of um sort of thwarted entitlement and, and fake victimhood in the in the political atmosphere these days and um uh, one uh, way I could bring that up to date would be to reference Diego Maradona the late Diego Maradona has just left us of course and um as has been widely commented um, he uh, really was lifted out of poverty um, of a more uh, extreme nature than really anyone today in, in uh, the UK or Australia, I could imagine. Um, and in later life, he was an outspoken advocate of justice for Palestinians. So is, is there a link there? You know, is, is there a link? Do, do we have to listen to people who have experienced conditions of genuine privation, genuine oppression uh, for their insights into these justice issues that you're talking about? as uh, an essential guide in this this world of cruelty and humanity yeah i mean some of the um i mean diego maradona and the um the manchester young manchester united footballer who's protested about um about uh, young young people in in britain going uh, going hungry um yeah it's important to listen to those to those people who were previously at the bottom of the pile in a way Mar maradona and the, the, the manchester united footballer are, are not necessarily the best examples because they they eventually became enormously wealthy as a result of this their, their skills but um, you know i'm mindful of the um of um people people at the bottom of the pile who have nothing who've shown enormous courage to uh, protest in dignity, to protest in justice. In particular, the four refugees who looked after Edward Snowden when he was on the run in Hong Kong from um, American authorities. Um, one was a Filipino, three were Sri Lankans. Snowden refers to their uh, enormous dignity, their enormous courage uh, toward, and their concern with what they call justice for somebody whom they they didn't know and he refers to their their grace and uh, says he would be forever grateful to them so there's a glimmer of hope then you know that that kind of um solidarity that kind of compassion that kind of empathy is still to be found even in those very trying and and pressured circumstances Yes, there is, but it's. Um, I've looked at the responses of the American people to the to hunger. You see massive queues of people and cars um, at, at food banks in America at the moment, and the response of the Americans is to say, um, "Oh well, we're all being uh, generous and kind to one another." That absolutely misses the point about the failure to prov to provide public services, public infrastructure, um, to avoid what John Kenneth Galbraith called um, private affluence and public squalor. Unless you address that in policy terms, then the cruelty uh, persists. And indeed, um, it, it, same, in, same in this country as well, you know, in many ways. John Pilger, for example, um, I know you, you know John Pilger of old, um, uh, Stuart was the founding director of the Sydney Peace Foundation and one of the uh, recipients of its annual Sydney Peace Prize was the journalist and filmmaker John Pilger and his new article is about the very much um, increased number of, of British children in particular um, who are now in food poverty. You, you think that would be almost unthinkable in uh, the sixth richest country on earth but um, nonetheless it is it is growing and spreading. How How can it reach those proportions to it in in, uh, in a, a situation of resource abundance how is it politically possible for that to happen well it's possible because of this absurd commitment to uh, the so-called free free market economics what you and i know as 
neoliberalism used to be called economic rationalism. I mean, it, is, it has been a, a cruel set of policies. It has basically said that, um, uh, that private accumulation and private wealth is the, is the is a purpose of life. Um, the best we can do is to um, uh, imitate um, alleged successful, although massively unsuccessful economies like the United States. I mean, John Pilger's film about the National Health Service gives you the explanation. It shows that the overture to the arrival of COVID-19 was the Tory decimation of the British National Health Service, regard, even trying to privatize it, trying to outsource all its services, mm -hmm. to regard people whom we now know as the key frontline workers as of little consequence, um, to be basically uh, underpaid, exploited, uh, invited to join the gig economy. That's why you've got this, this situation. And in a way, in a way that those policies, that way of thinking, contributed to COVID-19. Because of its, the manner of its um, origin or, or because of its, the, the nature of its spread? Well, well because, of, because of a way of living, because of why, because, because a way of living that said, let's, ex, that the, the winner takes all or winner, winner takes most, that we should exploit the the, the precious natural environment as much as possible. We should consume as much as possible. Should we, we should always have um, uh, economic growth. And the question, um, you know, what do you stand for? What do you believe in? Uh, what sort of society do you really want? And is society almost as important as economy? And I've got my tongue in my cheek at this point. Uh, uh, that, those, are the prob those are the problems. And unfortunately, even, in, even universities have colluded with that. Um, you know the the marketization of students just just um, no better than a than a second hand car to be um, you know bid for on in our case the prince's highway. Perish the thoughts. Perish the thought that university <laughs> should should be other than completely virtuous. Uh, let let me take you um, to the penultimate chapter of your book, um, humanity on the bonfire. And um, you go into the grave human rights abuses perpetrated in various countries around the world. Uh, and the list includes um, the Myanmar authorities, their persecution of the Rohingya Muslims. Um, it includes the cruelties of the Saudi regime against dissidents, um, the um, uh, abuses by the Chinese um, of uh, the Uyghurs and the democratic rights of, of people in Hong Kong. Um, and of course, Israel's treatment of the Palestinians. Now, of course, that's that's a, a, a list which um, uh, encompasses situations that meet tend to meet very uh, sharply differential responses uh, in the uh, the mainstream of, of political discourse, certainly here in the UK and also in Australia, um, with particular reference to Israel. Um, and Israel is is the biggest recipient of um, United States military aid. Um, I seem to recall that um, Caspar Weinberger, when he was Secretary of Defense under Ronald Reagan, referred to Israel as America's unsinkable battleship in the Middle East. Uh, and it seems that those kind of ties, those kind of calculations uh, uh, exempt um, Israel from censure in many of the world's capitals, even in the face of overwhelming impartially gathered evidence of its breaches and violations of international hum human rights, uh, international humanitarian law, and so forth. Are these some of the biggest obstacles to the realization of humanity as an organizing principle for our responses in this world? Um, absolutely. I mean, I started that chapter, um, Humanity on a Bonfire, um, with, the, with the concern that people would want me to say, you know, which form of cruelty was worse than another. And um, the thesis in that, and the and the overwhelming evidence is that um, uh, there's uh, there's no difference between uh, between um, the Rohingya, uh, the uh, the Myanmar military throwing small children into bonfires, um, and the um, uh, people in Surabaya uh, using their small children as suicide bombers and blowing them up, um, or the Israeli snipers killing 200 young Gazans and murdering and, and maiming 
as many as 25,000 uh, at the border. There's, there's really no difference. And, and the problem is we, we have massive public relations machines that go into denial that, the, that these things occur or that, that our behavior is as bad as anybody else. So you get a, an Australian government uh, moralizing that it respects human rights, even as its soldiers have apparently been murdering um, innocent uh, Afghanis, or even as it fails to protest the continued imprisonment of Julian Assange and the UK government and the uh, the um, and, and the um, the US government are are partners in this. And you mentioned Saudi Arabia. I mean, that's a that's a a duet, a constant duet between um, between the Americans and, and the Saudis to flog arms. So um, there's there's no difference, and because and the denial, I know, the denial is facilitates the cruelty. I mean, even even as the, the young kids were being thrown into a bonfire by the toddlers by the um, Myanmar military. Two days later, the Myanmar ambassador appeared at a podium in New York to, to claim that his country was highly respectful of human rights. Yeah, there's a, there's a, a sense that um, reality and, and uh, the discourse are part in company. Um, I'm going to um, quote, from, I'm going to read out a bit of poetry that you use in the book. Here it is. It's, it's uh, Catherine will give you the commercial in a minute, but it's uh, time to end it. Um, and um, your uh, final chapter is about a language of humanity. And um, it's surely no coincidence that um, of all the chapters that has the, the highest concentration of poetry in it. Uh, and of course, um, uh, poetry is um, a form of, of language which can kind of point at and, and hold so many more meanings than uh, perhaps a kind of uh, prose, uh, prosodic approach. And one of them is um, a quote from September the 1st, 1939, by W.H. Auden. There is no such thing as the state, and no one exists alone. Hunger allows no choice to the citizen or the police. We must love one another or die. So that's uh, very significant that you've selected that stanza um, as the almost the last word in your book. Um, how, how far should we look to poetry, do you think, in these times? Perhaps as an antidote to the kind of um, cynical um, use of discourse that you, you just referred to in the case of the Myanmar ambassador. Yeah, well, well we could, I mean, we must ask Catherine now whether we can have another hour to discuss that question. Look, the wonderful non uh, advocate of nonviolence, the wonderful um, Percy by Shelley, you know, the partner of Mary Wollstonecraft, um, um, said that poets were the uh, unacknowledged legislators of the world. What he meant was that uh, the vision that uh, that you can generate in poetry and in music and in great art and in great dance and in great hospitality um, was not of not not central to the mainstream of, um, of of governance and and it should be if you wanted to um, rediscover and re reemphasize a common humanity, you needed, you needed the vision that came in his, in his argument from um, poetry. And um, I mean, I partly use poetry, but also all sorts of illustrations from music, because, because as you know, I often encourage uh, colleagues and students to be as promiscuous as possible. And that, when you use that word in a lecture theater, it usually wakes up even the most sleepy student. Then you have to explain exactly what you mean. And what I mean is that we are, have a responsibility to seek inspiration from any source. It means we have to cross every discipline boundary and not be confined within them, because otherwise you will merely um, regenerate the status quo. Indeed. Now, I'm going to um, just alert um, our other participants here to the fact that we will imminently be um, turning to any questions uh, that you uh, would like to put to Stuart. Um, I'll be monitoring the Q&A um, function and, and um, making sure we, uh, we cover those. But um, just before we do, um, Stuart, um, one of the political figures um, who has been addressing these kinds of issues recently um, who has um, been quite willing to dip into uh, poetry um, to reinforce some of the points he's made is, of course, Joe Biden. 
and um, Joe Biden um, leading a, a ticket um, with the first African-American woman and indeed the first Indian-American woman um, ever to be on a, um, a winning uh, presidential ticket has just got um, 80 million votes in the United States, more than I think anyone's got before. Um, and um, he, um, of course, uh, in his acceptance speech, quoted Seamus Haney, you know, in Hope and History Rhyme. So is there a sense of transmission here somewhere? Is there uh, a spark of life? Is there a sort of uh, a, a, a feeling that um, at least enough people are coming to their senses to to close the door on the, uh, the idiocies of Trumpism and uh, try to um, embrace a, a better approach and a better awareness of some of the, the issues you've been discussing? Look, I'm pleased Joe Biden is elected, but I think it might flatter to deceive the reference to Seamus Haney and and and, and Joe's um, Joe's Irish connections and and poetry. Um, I'd like to when I I have to remember that um, uh, seventy more than seventy million people voted for Trump, uh, many of them armed to the teeth. Um, still with the the assumption that America is exceptional compared to the rest of the world. I still hear that. I still w w watched the film about American hunger and had people who were in dire straits saying, ah, but this is in still the best country in the world. I mean, this this sort of national illusion, the, the rise of absurd, dangerous nationalism and in a way you had that in britain with the um what i regard as the criminally stupid brexit vote the idea that in a world of massive interdependence you could go it alone and pretend and have um you know recall images of empire was um uh hopelessly wrong and when you're and, and you only have to <laughs> you only have to look at um, the cues of lorries trying to get to dover in order to be assessed um, you'd know that there was no poetry in that. Indeed. Well, I, actually, that's true. Um, but in a sense that there is a different kind of poetry, I think, in the fact that, um, you know, Kent voted to leave quite heavily, I think. And um, at one point recently, some of its residents woke up to find that um, uh, building work was underway to create an enormous lorry park on, on what had previously been open countryside to accommodate some of this um, uh, lorry traffic. Uh, only in the recent rain we had um, it flooded and so um, you know the people who were building it discovered why it had never been built on that is it's uh, on a floodplain so there's a kind of karmic poetry in that somewhere I think but yes I mean I think um, uh, you know you know that the, the, you know this country well um, the old sod as you've always referred to it and um, uh, it, it's still mired isn't it in um, a kind of uh, a hazy um, rather kind of um, mistily conceived view of former greatness, uh, untroubled, it seems, by a kind of um, a mountain of evidence that's certainly familiar to relevant scholarship about the nature of the British Empire and the experience of peoples in it um, and what it did and what it was about. Um, are the British, in a sense, trapped by these delusions uh, and now kind of about to pay the price with this uh, kind of um, a Brexit of idiocy, as you call it? Yeah, well, look, in a, in, in, in a way, the, the book, a Cruelty or Humanity, is asking people, asking all of us to think about what, what kind of future we want to, to build. And um, um, let me return to the question you posed right at the beginning of this, um, of this conversation, which was about, about peace. Now, when I lived in Britain, I campaigned for Britain to join the common market, to, to, to join the European Union, because on the grounds that we needed peace in Europe after centuries of carnage. That was the major platform for, for joining. It was about peace. But in your, in your referendum, as far as I could recall, there was no reference to the value of peace in Europe or peace around the world. That was the... That was the <laughs> The, the main uh, form of, of nurturing um, the idea of a European Union was about was about peace among peoples. And it, it was it was completely ignored. That's why I'm arguing um, that um, we need to be thinking in a totally different way about how to craft um, the um, the future. And in a way, the you know the Extinction Rebellion and um, and uh, Greta Thunberg. 
And, and, and Guterres, the Secretary General of the UN, is saying the same thing. That's the, the new dimension, of course, isn't it? We referred to John Pilger a few minutes ago as a, a, a laureate of the Sydney Peace Prize. And another one was um, the Indian, the great Indian environmentalist uh, thinker and activist, Dr. Vandana Shiva, um, the topic of whose talk was peace with the earth. Yes. Really, yes. ultimately, we, we all need to make peace with the earth or, um, or that's it. Yeah, yeah. Long before um, renewable energy became crucial to uh, people's to, to 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 economies. I mean, her her major book was called "Soil, Not Oil." <laughs> you don't need to do more than ponder the title of the book. Um, and and that's that's indeed a sort of quite active and and even politically traumatic debate in Australia at the moment, isn't it? That um, uh, the, the Morrison government in Australia is regularly name-checked as one of the main um, sort of uh, offenders of um, uh, against our climate, uh, and yet um, it seems prepared to keep brazening it out in the face of the evidence. Well, yeah, in, in order to respond to climate change and the terrible bushfires that we experienced um, uh, less than a, a year ago, the, the Prime Minister of Australia has become the captive of the fossil fuel lobby. And, and so we're supposed to have a gas recovery, even though most of the scientists would tell you that um, that is a, a, another massive way to pollute the atmosphere. But um, uh, the influence of those lobbies, usually fostered by the, by the poisonous Murdoch media around the world, um, is, is really, if you want to talk about getting rid of cruelty, if you want to talk about policies of justice, if you want to talk about a post-capitalist world, because that's what, that's what the post-COVID societies uh, have to be, otherwise we're all gone for. Otherwise, you in the UK are going to be permanently locked down. Um, that's, uh, that's, that's the alternative, that's the different way of living and thinking that uh, we have to promote. Well, that brings me to a question we've had from an audience member, actually. Um, if free market economics has allowed children to go hungry in the UK, what alternative can correct this problem? Well, the, the alternative is about the massive investment in, 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 in public services. It's about a way of thinking that says that wealth is in our common humanity, is in our, in our public schools and our public water systems and our public justice and our public hospitals. And um, you can call it socialism if you like. The problem, I mean, there's a, there's a problem that um, as soon as you utter that word, um, there's... Um, <laughs> Um, it's a bit like it's a bit like uh, uh, criticizing Israel. You're not there's certain things that are out of bounds. You're not allowed to talk about in his, even in a so-called free society. So there has to be that openness, that spontaneity, that that uh, freedom of, 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 of critique. That otherwise um, you just um, let the market run right and the children will continue to go hungry. And of course, it would be uh, much more likely to win support if it wasn't continued to to be polluted by the toxic sludge coming out of the Murdoch empire. Yeah, yeah, ab 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 absolutely. It's, um, look, it's, um, it's acknowledged here in this country now that the, the, Murdoch is, the Murdoch empire is not about journalism, it's only about propaganda. Hence the parliamentary inquiry that, that for, for people who haven't been following it, um, I think uh, I'm right in saying, you, you'll correct me if I'm wrong, Stuart, but two former prime ministers, uh, one from each party, Malcolm Turnbull and um, uh, Kevin Rudd, um, have teamed up um, and collected over half a million signatures on a petition to hold a parliamentary inquiry into the role of the Murdoch press. Yeah, I mean, and the look, the, the influence of, of Fox News, um, it's almost as though they, it's almost as though they want to imitate uh, Vladimir Putin or, 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 or Saudi Arabia or, or, or the policies of the state of Israel. I mean, I can't, when we talk about that sort of issue, I can't distinguish between uh, United States policy and um, an American policy or, or their, their, what I call their dance of death with the Saudis. 
Well, indeed, um, I have to say that um, the, the fox is my favourite animal from the English countryside. So I do feel sorry for the fox. It's now lumbered with these associations, you know, fox, <laughs> Lawrence, Lawrence Fox, Liam Fox, Claire Fox. What's the fox done to deserve this? I ask myself. But um, I'm afraid uh, for the moment, at least, that is all we have time for. Um, so thank you very much indeed, Stuart. Um, I'm going to anticipate Catherine's um, uh, contribution, which will come back in a minute by once again urging you to buy Stuart's book. It's a very uh, riveting read. Um, but um, with that, uh, that's all from me here in Oxford and that's all from you in Vincentia, Stuart. So um, thanks very much. And back to you, Catherine. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you to everyone for joining us today at this Bristol University Press webinar and particularly to our speakers, Stuart Rees and Jake Lynch for a really fascinating discussion. Details of how to order Stuart's book, Cruelty or Humanity, at 50% discount are available in the chat. That's the advert over. We're developing our spring programme of webinars, and the next one will be in January on Law and Order with others to follow. Please see our social media or website for details. Thank you once again for joining us today.